My name is Abraham Great and welcome again to this platform. Here you will learn tips that will help you to connect the dots. Now these tips has the proclivity to move you into action, to do something positive for a change, for you, for the community that you live in. Let's quickly look at five major differences between the southern and the northern part of Nigeria. So in 1900, when the Nigerian country was formed, it is important for us to know that the country was not founded as one country. So in 1900, when Nigeria was actually formed and the name Nigeria was actually coined, it was coined and founded on the principle of two countries. So we have the Northern Nigeria and we had the Southern Nigeria. And the funny thing is that both region had their own head. So you have the head or the president or the prime minister of this uh, Northern Nigeria and you have the head of the Southern Nigeria. That was the initial or the foundation of the country, of the nation. But at some point, the colonial masters or the colonialists, uh, uh, is the colonialists that, that you call them, they realized something very unique. The southern part of Nigeria was less resource. At the time, they couldn't see any major tangible uh, resources, but it has landmass. As a matter of fact, it has, at the time, according to their calculation, it has nearly, nearly, I mean, over 60% of the entire land of Nigeria uh, or the landscape of what they were putting together in terms of uh, the region that was surveyed was belonging to the northern part of Nigeria. But bear this, at that time, it does not necessarily mean that the northern part of Nigeria had the population that was larger than the southern Nigeria. However, the southern Nigeria was actually seen, even as at that time, as a more blessed, a more resourceful, a more uh, uh, economically viable and vibrant community. And even up as at that time of 1900, the southern people were already educated. They were already people who move around the world uh, already they trade every part of the world and they expose their mind they will now better be exposed with the involvement of the colonial uh, presence in in the country but something unique happened uh, during that time that the southern uh, the the colonial masters realized something that the best way to be able to take care of the deficiency on one part of the two country is to actually bring the country as one. So, so I, that would mean that all the derivations or all the resources would have to be centrally contributed so that it can be evenly distributed. The intention was that it should be centrally contributed so that it can be what? <laughs> evenly distributed. Now, what happened to execute that, the British had to send a man on a mission. And his major mission was to oversee the amalgamation of these two regions of Nigeria together. His name was Lord Lugard. So you may not understand this. Lord Lugard's one of his major premise for being assigned or being posted to Nigeria was actually to bring about the amalgamation of Nigeria, to bring the two countries as one. So eventually in 1914, uh, is it 1912? Oh, there was a 12 years period of all of this surveying, understanding, and trying to find the intricacy of how these two countries come together. I think 2012 was when Lord Lugard actually got his foot or his ang on the country of Nigeria to put it together, but it was in 1914 that the amalgamation happened, that the two countries had to be merged as one. Now, since that time, I will say this, that we can actually have differences. There are a thousand and one differences. Number one is the fact that we are divided on many things, on ethnicity, on religion, on so many things, but I'm just gonna give you a few um, 
if five you know clues to know number one the economy and the social imbalance between the northern and the southern country uh, or is for political sharing and it has always been for the benefits of you know a particular party or a particular section of the country because it appears as if power was ceded to that people in fact before the colonial people left it almost seemed as if if it is not all as assertive as it's been said that they were actually told that the country because of the size of the land that they had so one stark difference is that one part of the country well, number one <laughs> one part of the country believes that they nigeria is their own the southern part of the country, however, believes that Nigeria is our own. So that is a stark difference. Now, please understand this. This does not mean that everybody that you see in the north, in fact, the majority people that are my brothers, my sisters, my friend, that what have you, do not see the country Nigeria as this. But the ruling elite, particularly those who have been there since the 1959, and I may not have the time to tell you what happened in 1959 before we got the independence, in 1960, these people have passed on a notion to the ruling elite in that part of the world, like traditional rulers, like religious rulers, and political leaders. It's almost like a baton that is being passed on to know that we have this inhale, uh, inherent right to believe that Nigeria is house. But the southern part, uh, let me use a typical Nigerian English, out of gentility as thus far believe that Nigeria is our own. Let's all come together. But some other people, are, you're not getting this picture right. This country is ours. We actually have the supremacy. Uh, you know, and you can see that in some of the leaders, some of the brilliant minds that have run the country, uh, like someone that I respect so much, uh, you know, um, uh, Tafa Balewa of great memory, fantastic, great leader. But even someone like that actually passed on a mentality of that sort to believe that, you know, Nigeria or the northern part of Nigeria were given a baton of rulership. For Nigeria to change, we will really need an amendment of this mentality. The South, on the other hand, is much, you know, uh, uh, sober and trying to find an alignment, trying to find an agreement. And we must understand this. Number two difference between the North and the South, in my opinion, is the economic power. I was almost going to make it number one. The economic power. You look like places like uh, Lagos being the media center, the financial hub of the country. That's where most of the media presence are strong. It's the most metropolitan uh, city. Things are vibrant, you know, entertainment. It's just, if you want to go to Nigeria, you really got to be in Lagos. You'll enjoy the serenity of Abuja and the quietness of so many other parts of the country. But if you want to feel the vibe of Nigeria, you see that. And you will be shocked to know that the parity between the GDP of uh, the southern Nigeria compared to the southern Nigeria is actually a huge gap. So the economic is the number two, you know, the, uh, uh, difference between the two regions. Number three is what I call the census. There is a huge difference in ways that census are being conducted in the two regions in the country. But let me go back to 1959. In 1959, I'll say this. Nigeria had nearly the most important census because it will be the census that will determine and that will be documented in the forming document of independence. That and record shows, research shows, that there were clandestine moves that were made by certain groups. In fact, the name that they call some of those groups at the time is they used to call some of them the Sons of Oxford. <laughs> the Sons of Oxford. And this, th what happened is, from that point, maybe they rushed the census 
or for whatever reason that I'm trying to be politically correct for, the census, the first census that we have in this country is ambiguous. And since then till now, one of the things that you will notice is this, that the Southern Nigeria have always been ready. They've always been on, uh, uh, you know, easy to assess for census. If you call for census right now, the entire South are ready. They let us know the number of people that are here. But it comes across that maybe by the intricacies and you get what I'm trying to say by my political correctness, <laughs> you understand? I'm on, I'm, on, I'm on TV. But it comes across as the complication of the landscape or what have you of the North, the issue of censors have, no, have been ambiguous. And I know some of these things are very difficult to hear or to say, but the real truth is that Nigeria has truly never had any credible, in fact, there's nothing close to an honest censor. In fact, as a Nigerian, I doubt that Nigeria is 200 million people. That's the honest truth. I actually doubt because there is actually there is no system that is sure to have we may the Nigeria of today may actually be well above 200 million people the Nigeria of today may be well below 200 million people but the truth is that censors have been one of the bait of manipulating one another in that country censors has been one of the key thing to win election because now censors make it possible that one side of the country can actually say we have won election before even candidates are decided. So the, there is so much effrontery in that country that someone can actually say, look, we already have the number of votes that we need. It's as bad as it is actually the case now that one region of the country had to rally the other. I would say the South always have to play or dance to the tune of the North because there is a specific censorship or censored number that confers almost immediacy of supremacy of winning uh, elections to the North. So because of this, the South always dance to the tune of the North. So you see sometimes people from the South would almost worship whoever it is on the North that they have to listen to just because without that number that is being purported in the south or sorry in the north you cannot win election no matter how brilliant you are in the south and the rule to that was that my number two or number three yeah number three <laughs> the rule of the, the rule to overcome this is there needs to be a public debate there needs to be a honesty the country has to go back to rebuilding on decency, justice, honesty. Things for the future of the country to become great, we've got to address the issue of census. Number four is what I call military. The military formation, the military system. Now hear this. The northern part of Nigeria has been extremely wise to be a people who actually proliferate or enters into the Nigerian military more. Whilst the South are busy, you know, uh, doing what they want, you know, doing music. In the South, we actually, like someone like me, I've lived more of my life, I'm 44 years old now, but I've lived more outside of Nigeria than in Nigeria. But thankfully for me, I engage Nigeria almost every year I'm there. This year alone, I think I've been to Nigeria like five times. Yes, yes, 2021, I've been there four or five times already. So almost every time you realize that the people are trapped or the southern people, we are, uh, the, the southern are always called elitist. And that is not to say that they are not elite in the north. But generally, the uh, southern people are more ambitious to go out, live in the diaspora. But whilst you and I are spending 25 years, 30 years, some of us 40 years in the diaspora, 
the northern people go through the education sometimes they don't even finish their education they are already they know that if you have this level of education you can go straight into the military and some of them actually will travel abroad they will go to the same places that you and i go to to england to america to europe to asia to study but they are looking and, and i've studied with some of them i've studied with some of the children and you know whilst we are looking for how we will get residency of the country we've gone to study. These guys can't wait for the next holiday. They're going back home. They can't wait till they graduate. Some of them, they will not spend one week after graduation. They're out, <laughs> they're out. And guess what, once they get back, they're in the military, they're in politics, they are already setting up. Now, the parity, what that means is this. By the time you come back home and you're wanting to effect a change or uh, people who are home, who are doing music, who are doing comedy, we are, we are busy, you know, making the country flow, we're creating entertainment, we're actually creating wealth. These guys, the, your colleague that you went to school together is already 12 years in the military. So by so doing, by the time they, you, you have the opportunity now to put people in strategic places, most of the people that you have, the number of northern people at the top they are much larger than the people that you have from the south. Number five difference is the, I call it the principle of unanimity. The principle of unanimity. Now it is often believed in Nigeria that the northern part of Nigeria is united. Let me see this. The North are actually not united. The Northern part of Nigeria are unanimous. They're unanimous in the fact that if they say this is the direction that we are going, everybody believe in that direction. Like we all know that since nine, I mean, since 1816, Nigerian census has always been manipulated. But if the North say this is the number we have, everybody in the North is going to agree that that's the number we have. On the other side, on the other side of the aisle, in the southern part of Nigeria, if you present them the 19, I mean the 1816 election or the 1959 elec uh, uh, census rather, uh, the 1816 uh, census or the 1959 census or every other census that Nigeria have had, they will, and rightfully so, they will query everything. Now, in the North, the unanimity means that if a candidate is decided that this is the person going for us or this is the way we are going, not necessarily that they agree with the person, they're not necessarily in unity with the person, they just believe there is a direction for us to go. We are all going that direction and everybody will follow. So it is easier to get almost everyone in that place to get a similar result because the majority are unanimous in the way they act. On the south, on the other hand, if I was to stand up now and said I want to, uh, everyone in the south is going to query, oh, you did one video, you said one thing, people will look, I call it PhD, pull him down or pull her down. We don't know, but it's a syndrome. <laughs> they will do everything possible. And most of the time, because everyone in the South actually aspire to be where the other person has been. And sometimes we do not know it that it's out of envy or it's out of jealousy or it's out of spite. We just want to find everybody in the South is looking for fame, is looking for more Twitter followership, is looking for more Facebook, is looking for a blue tick on our, uh, on our social medias, is looking for attention which the south the northern people don't care about we want to be famous in the south and because we want to be famous if something happened to you right now i will quickly tweet about it i want to go viral on what have you whereas on the south they're more careful they've been taught a lot of things in their families traditionally in their religion settings traditionally that they should honor one another they should respect one, one another. And until we get to a point where the South themselves will have an agenda and the agenda will be number one, to understand the North and then to also have a counter agenda, not to be against the North, but to have an agenda. I, I'll say that again. So that the, the South must have an agenda. And the primary 
uh, um, element of that agenda is number one, to understand the Northern agenda. Number two is to then have an agenda to be able to counter the Northern agenda, not to fight the North. But imagine, as I've always said in politics of Nigeria is a game of chess. So imagine there is no chess where you are the only one player. You will always have two sides. So each side must have a strategy that they want to play with. So first of all, understand the antecedent of the other side that understand their strategy. Then you too have your own strategy so that you can play against them. Play to win, not just play to be famous or to be popular. Because sometimes, and even right now, if a candidate is being presented from the South, it doesn't matter if it is the candidate that has the capability or that has the resources, then we'll remember. We'll call them a thief. We'll call them this. We'll call them that. And sometimes some of the things we're saying is true. But the real truth is that some of those people that we actually accuse, they are better than some of us in terms of leadership quality, in terms of management quality. They have done things, they have built organizations, they have built cities. They've, yeah, they might have gotten rich at the end of that, uh, as a result of that. But how are they different from the Clinton family? How are they different from the Bush family? That the entire uh, uh, country, uh, the state of Texas, you can see the signature of, uh, of the Bush family on there. Well, how are they different? But the South, even right now what I'm saying, some people will still criticize me because it's inherent in the Southern people to query what doesn't make sense to them. But if you must have a game plan, sometimes you have to stoop to conquer. I hope this helps and I hope you can be part of merging the two countries together to continue to be one or helping us to develop a system where we can go back to being two countries but we can op operate i mean having two constitutions but still live under the same umbrella that we have created well guess what my name is abraham great it is working